Hi, Teardown time again. Um, today we've got this Pure Digital DMX60. Um, it's a digital radio CD player and it'll play MP3s off um, SD cards. Um, bought this because I wanted a digital radio. It was cheap on eBay because the um, CD drawer wasn't working, so we'll take it apart and um, find out about that and just do a general teardown in the process. Um, it's been a long time since I've taken apart a bit of consumer hi fi equipment, so it'd be interesting to see you know, what, how things have changed over the last it's maybe 15 20 years since I've sort of taken something uh, like this apart. So it'd be interesting to see what's changed over the years. Just a quick look on the back you've got all the things you'd expect speaker terminals and spring clamps couple of line inputs, auxiliary output, um, optical digital out. The only unusual thing is this USB port. This is for firmware updates and also to access the, the um, SD card on the front. Inside we've got this big troidal mains transformer. I was sort of partly ex half expecting to see a switch mode supply for the audio. But this is a sort of slightly high-end device so maybe they use the, the, the toroid just to minimise noise um, and weren't too concerned about the weight. Um, we've got this digital board on the right hand side here. Um, one thing immediately notice is there's a lot of these groups of vias. Um, this is basically a technique known as stitching where you use a large number of vias to couple the ground plane on uh, the two sides of the PCB to minimise inductance um, to avoid high frequency noise getting where it shouldn't do. There's um, And uh, down here, this is probably the audio output side. We'll have a look at this board in detail in a minute. And from the top there, this is the audio amplifier board. Um, they're using one of these STK hybrids. Now, these things have been used for as long as I can remember in audio gear, um, probably at least 30 years. And they're a hybrid construction. Um, there's like an aluminium base plate with some um, generally a ceramic PCB with the die and other components directly um, bonded onto it for good thermal coupling. Um, there's a few other, I think there's probably regulators or something, sort of five pin devices on the heatsink. Um, this is a single layer board, it's made of a bonded paper material which again is very common in consumer electronics. Um, in amplifiers there's a lot of high power components, so it generally is done in through hole. Um, there's a lot of wire links here, these are, automatic, all, all, these are all automatically placed by very expensive machines. Um, so instead of using a double layer board, it's a single layer board with a few wire links where necessary. Input rectifiers here, and you'll notice that, um, there's a capacitor connected across each diode. Again, this is a very common technique in anything audio or with a radio um, involved. It basically redu reduces the switching noise that um, you get with the rectifiers. Each diode turns on and off through the main cycle. Uh, if you don't have those capacitors there, they can reduce um, some short bursts of fairly high frequency noise. And this so you can see the back of the heatsink with lots of fins. And there's also a small power board here. Um, this provides the standby power. There's a relay on there that switches power to the main toroidal when the thing's turned on. Um, because in nowadays equipment has remote controls to turn, turn on and off and soft, soft power switches. So it needs a low power standby supply just to keep the logic running. Just wait, basically waiting for you to turn it on or running a timer for turning on automatically. Uh, here's the back of the uh, front PCB, there's not, not a great deal on there. There's another Xilinx CPLD in here, that's probably just going to be logic expansion, um, producing yeah, more logic control lines for all the keys on the front. There's a few capacitors there, there's the back of the LCD flex. You see some more stitched vias there, but there's not really a lot else on that board. Right, this is a view of the uh, rear PCB, it's not really much on here, there's a main transformer, a relay to switch power to the, um, the toroid. Um, rectifier, voltage regulator, um, not really very much to see on there. Uh, the input cable goes through a toroid, but there's also this thing which is sort of, I'm not sure if that's heat shrink or a polythene bag, let's have to take a look inside that see what's in there. Yeah, inside all that sleeving there's just another mains filter, so there's quite a lot of filtering on here to, you know, to, to reduce the difference coming from the mains, probably at least as much to filter what it kicks back. Um, I'm almost wondering if this rear board is some sort of off-the-shelf thing, so I mean I don't understand why they wouldn't have fitted this filter directly on the PCB, unless maybe it was just a bit of an afterthought, um, they sort of found it was too noisy and then they added this later instead of redesigning the PCB, or maybe the PCB was used in another product that didn't have the digital, digital stuff inside it. Um, so they thought it was easy just to use this separate filter rather than incorporating it onto the PCB. One handy tip when you're taking stuff apart that's got lots of screws, you tend to find you know, you've got loads of different types of screws in different lengths. So if, as you take stuff apart, you actually put each set of screws in a different compartment, so you know, the initial case screws, um, these for example the screws that hold the back off, 
then if you actually group them like that it means that when you put it back together again you can just go back in the sequence and you know that you're using uh, at least roughly the right set of screws and you'll probably still have some left over at the end but they always put too many screws in these things anyway don't they this is the top side of the logic board not a great deal to see here it's mostly the through hole components on the audio section got the antenna connection um, some ptfe cables a bit of a surprise in a consumer piece of kit quite expensive um, the flex connector for the, to the front panel um, what is quite nice is they've actually labeled all the um, connector functions here as you can see that's a JTAG connector there next to it is the CD drawer so you've got CD open and close so you've got the mechanical functions I squared C on there and then here we have um, the digital audio SPDIF digital audio from the CD so clearly the CD unit is a complete integrated unit with now one little detail here, in addition to all the connectors we've got this separate soldered ground lead. This goes from the ground of the um, this section in here. And this actually goes right back to the negative of the capacitor on the audio stage. This is probably just to get a good solid um, audio sort of style ground type arrangement because the problem is all these little thin, lead, thin wires and connectors have got significant resistance and inductance um, so that can actually couple noise into the signal so this is just establishing a nice sort of solid ground reference. Yeah, it, may well, it probably isn't a bodge wire, it probably was designed that way originally. Um, the other thing I noticed on this can, there's like this little finger that connects the, the can to this the RF front end here. Um, another little detail I just noticed behind the um, audio, they've got all these little toroidal chokes. Again, this is going to be to stop um, any radiated RF noise from in here getting out and onto the audio cables. And the audio cables then act as an antenna, so it produces interference. So that's what those are going to be for. And in here we've got a basically a little plug-in module. Um, there's a silicon chorus, I'm guessing that's going to be custom chip, this is a, a DAB digital audio receiver, um, the actual PCB, it says sort of frontier silicon, so I'm guessing this is just a complete module for the digital audio functionality, and there's also provision for another can on there, that may be for when the whole thing isn't fitted inside a can, um, they've just got provision for putting another screening can on there, so let's take this board out and see what's on it. Right, as you can see there's actually nothing on the back side of this at all, um, just the connector here and all the there's lots and lots of um, RC filters on all the digital lines this is again to pre prevent noise from this digital board getting out into the audio. I'm just taking a closer look at this digital board um, this is a chip from Frontier Silicon they specialize in um, digital audio products this device is a digital signal processor um, which has got a small boot ROM and 384k of RAM so we've got this Atmel serial flash, the whole firmware is probably going to be in there um, which is loaded into the RAM at startup. Um, this is a Wolfson um, audio digital that to analog converter and we've got some external SRAM here. Um, this unit will do things like record and do like light pause of digital radio contents, act as a memory buffer to store the, the data while it's in pause mode. Um, and there's this additional RF front end with a separate little can on it. And inside the uh, can we've got this um, FS1110 um, front end chip. This again is made by Frontier Silicon and this handles all the, um, the RF stuff. Um, down converts it to a low frequency to a form that the, uh, the main base brand processor can handle. And there's also a crystal for frequency. There's a phase lock loop here to do all the frequency uh, selection stuff. An interesting little detail on the audio board. A couple of things. Firstly, um, you can see that a lot of the grounds go to this back to the central point. This will be at the junction of the two main reservoir capacitors. There's a technique called star grounding, um, which means that, for example, if you get a lot of current, if, if you didn't do this, for example, if you had to say, say took another ground from here, then any current that's flowing this track would produce a voltage on this ground point because of the current resistance of the track between here and here. So all the paths that actually draw current are taken down to one central point so that current being drawn from one place isn't going to influence the ground reference voltage um, for other parts, for example the low level audio stuff. The other is that you can see there's actually solder covering all these tracks. Um, this is a simple technique just to increase the current capability without having to spend the money on using thicker copper on the PCB. Um, these boards are flow soldered uh, in a wave soldering machine so um, all they have to do is just leave the solder resist off the track and this will actually get coated in solder as it goes through the wave solder machine um, which will effectively thicken up the track for the parts that are carrying the high, higher currents. This is the CD player assembly. Um, underneath we've got um, 
the optical head here, a couple of motors, sled motor, um, loading motor and the spindle motor, nothing too exciting for the standard stuff. Um, on top there's this board, this had a children can on it. Um, not a great deal on here, there's one chip that seems to do pretty much everything. This is, um, it's actually labelled Philips, but these days it will be NX, NXP um, SAA 7824 and this seems to handle pretty much all of the um, CD player functionality. It's like a you know CD player on a chip basically. Yeah, I've had a look through the data sheet on this chip and it looks like it does have a CD-ROM mode where it just streams the data through the SP diff port so in CD-ROM MP3 playing mode it will just be streaming data up to the main audio processor and that's going to be doing the MP3 decoding. This is the other side of the board, not really a lot to see here except here. Um, the, un the other side of this, this is actually the power driver chip, this is how it controls all the motors and all the uh, mechanical stuff. Um, and we can see these, again, I think similar to what we saw on the audio board, they've left resist off here just to get a slightly reduced impedance to, um, I think this is probably just conducting the, any ground noise from the motor driver down to sort of big chunky bits of the ground plane to reduce noise. Now I've got into the uh, main mechanism and see what the actual problem was. When I first opened this up I found four of these screws just floating around inside. Um, this whole CD deck is on a sort of spring-loaded floating mount. Um, and it looks like these screws are actually in these pillars to limit how far up it could go but the pillars all seem to have broken my guess is it may have been dropped either that or the plastics deteriorated but I think the fact that all these have gone in this way um, I think this has probably had a fairly either a drop or some mechanical problem that's just made these pillars completely disintegrate. It's the actual CD mechanism with all the uh, actual mechanical parts. It's amazing how much they've simplified this mechanism over the decades since the original CD players. Um, you've got the sled motor and a gear train, so this gives you your course movement. It just slides up. There's a single rod and a single bearing. The other side just sits on this this part of the chassis and the spindle motor couldn't really be any more simple it's just a motor with a spindle mount on, on the end of it so this is the optical assembly that's going to be a custom photodiode array that's got the all the optical sensing for both the tracking and the actual signal coming off the, the CD um, the laser diode is there um, it's interesting they've got this sort of detail where they've, they've done a slot my guess is this is for mechanical reasons, so that this is effectively has got a little bit of flexibility in it. Um, possibly just to decouple mechanical vibration or to avoid stress on the leads, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, there's got to be a good reason why they've done that, that detail there on the PCB. These little wires go up to the voice coil, so there's, there's um, voice coil actuators that give it the fine tracking and focus control on here, the actual probably can't see it here but the actual assembly is floating on some wire you can just about see there's some very thin suspension wires to give it its motion but considering yeah, this is a very high precision optical tracking task it's you know, interesting how simple they've got the mechanism these days and here we can see these broken pillars there's basically a spring to provide the floating and the pillars or the pillars are doing providing an end stop now fortunately the back side of these is actually fairly flat so I think what I can probably do is just machine the pillars completely off and just replace them with an alternate pillar to do the same thing so that's probably fairly fixable right, one minor issue is figuring out how tall these pillars are supposed to be now this one actually had enough of it left to measure um, the ones at the back I think are shorter because the springs, there's actually two different heights of spring and because this thing hinges up that way these ones are going to be a bit shorter but the it's not clear whether the top edge of here is close to the original top edge so I might need to do a bit of experimenting to uh, figure that out. But, I mean the size of these pillars isn't all that critical, all they're doing is limiting how far upwards this, this can go so um, I think we can probably figure something out. I'm just going to clean these up and flatten the um, the base so we can put another pillar in there. Right, so taking some of this as generic space material, you can just cut to whatever length you like. Um, just cut a couple of lengths there, fixed it on the back with a self-tapping screw, so we've now got some pillars again. Right, that's all four screws done. Um, one of the screws had completely gone missing, so I just improvised with a standard screw and a washer. 
does the same thing but it's now floaty and bouncy and doesn't crash into the tray now so let's put it all back together and see if it works. Uh, the tray seems to move quite happily. Just before we put the rest back together, let's take a look at what the um, reed head's doing. It's quite interesting. On most CD players it will try to focus on the disc before it even starts spinning it to tell if there's something there. So the tray goes in, you can see the laser head, it thinks about it for a second, and then it tries to get a focus on the disc. Right, let's try a CD. Check it plays to the end in case that those stops were preventing the mechanism from being in the right place. So if it's lifted at the back then it might not play all the way to the outside edge, but that looks right. Thank <laughs> you. 